use headphones for best experience. to do another Wikipedia Rambo video and uh, I'm not gonna draw so much today actually I didn't have any plans to draw anything at all but um, then I just started to think about maybe one thing I would like to draw later. Um, but this is going to be like a Rambo video. I'm going to read from Wikipedia quite a lot. Uh, first I'd like to do a shout out or actually I would like to show you this drawing that I got on Instagram. So it was Adam who sent this uh, this drawing to me. So it's a portrait of me of Ace Magdica. and uh, I was so happy when I got this one. Such an honor to be depicted as a, a cartoon or comic figure like this. So. I, I'm saying, today I will be reading from a comically large book to you because the artist was too lazy to draw the rest of my body. So I'm sitting behind this comically large book, as you can see. And the title of this book is in Swedish it's långt vid sidan av vägen i närheten av skogen åt det håll där solen går ner bodde jag ibland om sommaren it's a very long title and uh, actually this is uh, from a video that I made really long time ago when I was reading from this book actually with this very long title and it means in English um, far away uh, at the side of the road close to the forest in the direction where the sun goes down I used to spend time during the summer. So it was so fun that uh, Adam included this title in this picture. I, I don't think he knows Swedish language. I think he's from the US. So thank you so much for this. This. I just realized there is another um, another um, ASMR channel uh, where you can find a lot of uh, educational ASMR actually I talked about another channel a little while ago but this one is called ASMR Learn and 
and um, there are a lot of yeah you can see it's more learned there are a lot of uh, videos with a lot of facts. So 30 facts about NASA, 67 facts about evolution, 40 fa uh, facts about World War II, 15 facts about our ocean, 45 facts about rainforests. So there are mostly like still images. It's not a lot of moving images. It's a still image and then it's whispering a lot of facts. It's perfect if you want to to just listen and fall asleep to this and also learn something. It's really interesting and it's really relaxing so I, I recommend this channel. And um, Yesterday I watched a documentary on uh, on TV, so it was a documentary about some species um, uh, living in the Andes in um, yeah in South America. You know, from from uh, the, along the western coast of South America, like this, and um, it was so interesting. I realized I should be watching these types of documentaries more often because I I I watch uh, documentaries quite a lot actually, but it's uh, mostly when I want to know something and uh, like google for it or search on youtube for a specific topic that i already know that i want to know more about so i almost forget how interesting and fascinating it can be to just watch uh, like a weekly show a documentary show that's on regular television for example and just uh, learn s so many new things and um, this time it was a nature documentary about this region um, and uh, especially this part of the Andes, uh, the Altiplano and uh, I had heard about Altiplano a bit, just a little bit because I'm when I made this uh, cup and climate Cup and Climate Zones video uh, a couple of weeks ago I mentioned Altiplano a uh, high plateau here high elevated plateau in between two mountain ranges here where the Andes are like the widest uh, so it's the second highest uh, plateau in the world the, the highest one is uh, in the Tibetan uh, plateau in yeah, in Asia um, but it was so interesting and there were like a lot of volcanoes here as well and there were poisonous lakes a poisonous red lake and there were a huge salt an old lake a dried totally dried out lake that's now like a, s a salt desert and I have to show you on Google Maps how or Google Earth Google Maps I mean satellite image here what it looks like so it's in Bolivia mostly, the Altiplano region. Here you can see it looks like snow. And it's more than 10,000, I think, 
or approximately 10,000 square kilometers, so it's a huge area. Called uh, Salar de Uyuni. Uyuni. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's super fascinating. I had to look this up on uh, Wikipedia. Hexagonal formations, yeah, six sides like this, totally uh, regular pattern. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> no, one. This is probably I should have drawn this. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's a totally even pattern with these hexagons, these formations, in a total flat. Like, used to be a lake. Yeah, why don't we start to read about it? Salar de Uyuni, or Salar de Tunupa. is the world's largest salt flat, or playa, at over 10,000 square kilometers, or 3,900 square miles, in area. It is in the Daniel Campos province in Potosí, in southwest Bolivia, near the crest of the Andes, at an elevation of 3,656 meters above sea level. The Salar was formed as a result of transformations between several prehistoric lakes. It is covered by a few meters of, of salt crust, which has an extraordinary flatness, with the average elevation variations within one meter over the entire area of the Salar. Um, I have, haven't heard the, the word Salah being pronounced before, so I hope I pronounce it right. Um, the crust serves as a source of salt and covers a pool of brine. Um, which is exceptionally rich in lithium. The large area clear skies and exceptional flatness of the surface make the salar I cannot pronounce it in Spanish I guess ideal make the salar ideal for calibrating the al altimeters alt altimeters of earth observation satellites following rain a thin layer of dead calm water transforms the flat into the world's largest mirror, 129 kilometers, or 80 miles across. That's so cool <laughs> that uh, it becomes a mirror, that large mirror. And here you can see the location in Bolivia. And the elevation as well, we can compare. So it's really high altitude here. The Salar serves as the major 
transport route across the Bolivian Altiplano and is a prime breeding ground for several species of flamingos. Salar de Uyuni is also a climatological transitional zone since the towering tropical cumulus conguestus and cumulonimbus incus clouds that form in the eastern part of the salt flat during the summer cannot permeate beyond its drier western edges near the Chilean border at the Atacama Desert. Salar has been used in a filming location for movies such as Star Wars The Last Jedi 2017 as Planet Crate. The Fall, 2006, Salt and Fire in 2016, The Unseen, 2017, and several others. Formation, Geology and Climate Sala de Uyuni is part of the Altiplano of Bolivia in South America. The Altiplano is a high plateau which was formed during uplift of the Andes Mountain. The plateau includes fresh and saltwater lakes as well as salt flats and is surrounded by mountains with no drainage outlets. The geological history of the Salar I'm I'm a bit worried I'm a, I'm pronouncing Salar wrong, I had to check. Because it's so annoying if I keep saying it, and and, um, and it's pronounced in another way in English. Salar means salt flat in the Spanish language. Then I should probably not say sailor or something like that. No. The geological history of the Salar is associated with a sequential transformation between several vast lakes. Some 30,000 to 42,000 years ago, the area was part of a giant prehistoric lake, Lake Minchin. That's so interesting. Lake Minchin is the name of an ancient lake in the Altiplano of South America. It existed where today the Salar de Oyuni, Salar de Coipasa and Lake Pupo lie. It was formerly considered the highest lake in the Altiplano, but research indicated that the highest shoreline belongs to the later Lake Tauca instead, or Tautha. The concept of uh, Lake Minchin was first coined in 1906. I don't read further here. green and two white expanses were formerly covered by Lake Minchin. So this green one here and these two white salt flats. And here on Google Maps you can see these flats here 
and this lake here, Lake Pupo. Here we have Lake Titicaca, biggest lake in South America, at a real high altitude in the Andes Mountain. So even though this is a really big area, this salt flat, you can still see it when you zoom out like this. Take a look at the entire continent. You can still see it here. But it used to be really huge lake here, I guess, including this lake, also this lake, Lago Uru, Uru Uru. So you can see this lake is blue, dark blue, this lake is very green. You can see it's flat here. And the mountains and the volcanoes are is in the on the edge of this Altiplano region. was Lake Minching. Let's go back to Sala de Uyuni. Its age was estimated by radiocarbon dating shells from outcropping sediments and carbonate reefs and varies between reported studies. Lake Minching, named after Juan P. Minchin of Oruru later transformed into Paleo Lake Tauca, Tauta, having a maximal depth of 140 meters and an estimated age of 13,000 to 18,000 or 14,900 to 26,100 years, depending on the source. The youngest prehistoric lake was Coipasa, which was radi radiocarbon dated to 11,500 to 13,400 years ago. When it dried, it left behind the two modern lakes, Pupo and Uro Uro. Uru Uru. and two major salt deserts, Salar de Coipasa and the larger Salar de Uyuni. Salar de Uyuni spreads over 10,582 square kilometers, which is roughly 100 times the size of the Bonville salt flats in the United States. Lake Pupo is a neighbor of the much larger Lake Titicaca. During the wet season, Titicaca overflows and discharges into Pupo, which in turn flood, floods, floods Salar de Coipasa and Salar de Uyuni. What's this? Lacustrine mud. I have no idea what this is. Lacustrine mud that is in interbedded with salt and saturated with brine underlies the surface of Salar de Oyoni. The brine is a saturated solution of so sodium chloride, lithium chloride and magnesium chloride. chloride in water. It is covered
prepared with a solid, solid salt crust varying in thickness between tenths of centimeters and a few meters. The center of the salar contains a few islands, which are the remains of the tops of ancient vol volcanoes submerged during the era of Lake Minching. They include unusual and fragile, fragile coral-like structures and deposits that often consist of fossi fossils and algae. The area has a relatively stable average temperature. It's about the climate here. There's a picture of of Inacho Inachuasi Island in the center of the Salad. The salar contains a large amount of sodium, potassium, lithium, and magnesium, all in the chloride forms of. Yeah, here you can see. In Swedish, we say natrium chloride, kalium chloride, lithium chloride, and magnesium dichloride, I guess, respectively, as well as borax. Borax. Borax, also known as sodium borate, sodium tetra tetraborate, or disodium tetraborate, is a compound with a formula. Oh my god. Di din dinotrium tetra. Have to remember how to pronounce this, at least in Swedish. But I have no idea. H. I don't even know the English word for it. Vetta in Swedish. Hydrogen, of course. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Um, what's P? Is it bor? Bor. Chemistry. Okay, boron. 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 Mm -hmm. So it's uh, two. What's in Swedish? Natrium, and that is sodium in English. <laughs> then it's four. Uh, of uh, Vata, and that's hydrogen in English, and four boron, and nine oxygen, and then some water, I guess, here. But anyway, you can see. Sodium and four water molecules. 
something like that. I wish I knew more about chemistry. I think it's interesting, actually. Um, but what is borax? What is it used for? Gold mine. Borax was first discovered in dry lake beds in Tibet and was improved via the Silk Road to, to the Arabian Peninsula in the 8th century AD. Borax first came into common use in the late 19th century when Francis Marion Smith, Pacific Coast Borax Company, began to market and popularize a, a large variety of applications under the 20 mule team Borax trademark. Named for the method by which borax was originally hauled out on the California and Nevada deserts. Borax is a component of many de detergents, cosmetics and enamel glazes. Detergents. Have to look up detergent. Okay, so these are detergents. I actually use some detergents when I cleaned these. You know, I had um, written a lot of names here. Then I, I used this. This. Um, mixtures to have it clean. So, enamel glazes. Okay. So when you have this uh, enamel on on ceramics, I guess, on pottery, you can use borax, fire retardant. Antifungal compound in the manufacture of fiberglass as a flux in metallurgy. In metallurgy, a flux derived from Latin fluxus meaning flow. Okay. It's a chemical cleaning agent, flowing agent, or purifying agent. Flux, fluxes have, may have more than one function at a time. They are used in both extractive metallurgy and metal joining. Some of the earliest known flu fluxes were sodium carbonate, potash, charcoal, coke, borax, lime, lead sulfide, and certain minerals containing phosphorus. Iron ore was also used as a flux in the smelting of copper. Yeah, pot ash is really interesting. I've already been on this page, the pot ash page, but maybe I can return to that one. Yeah, it was when I looked up potassium, because as I mentioned before, the cellar contains a large amount of sodium, potassium, lithium, magnesium, and borax. And uh, I didn't know what potassium was, but it's the English word for kalium. Kalium is the name in German and also in Swedish. And that's why it's uh, and the chemical letter for it is K. Potassium is a, but I was interested in why does what, what comes the name potassium from? 
and um, yeah, I can start to read this, so you'll see. Potassium is a chemical element with the symbol K from Neo Latin Kalium and the atomic number 90. Potassium is a silvery white metal that is soft enough to be cut with a knife with little force. Potassium metals react rapidly with atmospheric oxygen to form flaky white potassium peroxide in only seconds of exposure. It was first isolated from pot ash, the ashes of plants, from which its name derives. So let's take a look at the potash page as well. Potash includes very various mined and manufactured salts that contain potassium in water solubility soluble form. The name derives from pot ash, which refers to plant ashes or wood ash soaked in water in a pot, which was the primary means of manufacturing the product before the industrial era. The word potassium is derived from pot ash, so that was really interesting. That's why we have the name potassium. Potash is produced worldwide in, in amounts exceeding 90 million tons per year, mostly for use in ferti ferti fertilizer. A fertilizer is any material of natural or synthetic origin that is applied to soil or to plant tissues to supply plant nu nutrients. Fertilizers may be distinct from uh, liming materials or other non-nutrient soil amendments. Many sources of fertilizer exist, both natural and industrial produced. For most modern agricultural practices, fertilization focuses on three main macronutrients, nutri uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. So that's really good to know somehow. With um, occasional addition of, of supplements like rock dust for micronutrients. Farmers apply these fertilizers in a variety of ways, through dry or pelletized or liquid application processes, using large agri agriculture equipment or hand tool methods. Historically, fertilization, fertilization ca uh, came from natural or organic sources like compost animal manure, human manure, harvested minerals, crop rotations, and byproducts of human nature industries, fish processing waste, or blood meal. Okay, I think I have read enough about fertilizer. Now I have a clue of what it is. No doubt. Various kinds of fertilizer potash constitute the single greatest industrial use of the um, element potassium in the world. Potassium was first derived in 1807 by electro electrolysis of caustic potash or potassium hydroxide. Here you can see a picture of a polycrystalline potash with the US penny for reference here. The coin is 19 millimeter in diameter and copper in color.
Potash refers to potassium compounds and potassium bearing materials, most commonly potassium carbonate. The word potash originates from the mi Middle Dutch potashen, denoting pot ashes in 1477. The old method of making potassium carbonate was by collecting or producing wood ash, the occupation of ash burners, leaching leaching the ashes and then evaporating the resolute solution in large iron pots, which left a white residue denominated pot ash. Approximately 10% by weight of common wood ash can be recovered as pot ash. Later, pot ash became widely applied to natural, naturally occurring potassium salts the commercial product derived from them. Although it most probably derived its name where it was used from the anion, anion of the acid that replaced the carbonate moiety and common equi... Now we have so many words I don't know how to pronounce. A common equivocative use of potash for potassium. So even though it's not potassium is not potash, but still potassium can sometimes be called potash, I guess. The ashes of plants from which its name derives. In the periodic table, potassium is one of the alkali metals, all of which have a single valence electron in the outer electron shell that is easily removed to create an ion with a positive charge occasion. Yeah, I remember this from chemistry in like high school. Um, when they have just one single electron, it's very easy for that electron to just jump to another uh, or leave the the atom. So, and I always thought this was a reason that the metal was so soft that you can cut it with a knife because, yeah, that's that. That was my association. I don't know if that's the right association, but. That was how I remembered it. Um, so it was cool, these like metals that were so soft. And it, it is this, uh, because when you think of a metal, you, you, at least I think of something really solid, strong. Um, these alkali metals are something else. The alkali metals consist of the chemical elements lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Together with hydrogen, they, they constitute group 1, which lies in the S block of the periodic table. All alkali metals have their out, outermost electron in a s, s orbital. This shared electron configuration results in their having very similar characteristic properties. Indeed, the alkali metals provide the best example of group trends in properties in the periodic table, with elements exhibiting well characterized humologous behavior. This family of elements is also known as the lithium family after its leading element. The alkali metals are shiny, soft, highly reactive metals at standard temperature and pressure and uh, readily lose their outermost electron to form cations with charge plus one. They can all be cut easily with a knife due to their softness, exposing a shiny surface 
that uh, tarnishes rapidly in air due to oxidation by atmospheric moisture and oxygen. And in the case of lithium, nitrogen. Because of their high re reactivity, they must be stored under oil to prevent reaction with air and are found natu naturally only in salts, and never as a free element. Cesium, the fifth alkali metal, is the most reactive of all the metals. All the alkali metals react with water, with the heavy heavier alkali metals reacting more vig uh, vigorously, vigorously than the lighter ones. Yeah, so it has something to do with salt. Salts are actually, um, it's uh, alkali metal and something that neutralizes it. Uh, probably. Uh, that's also interesting, I think, that salt is like super chemical. <laughs> Everything is of course chemical, but I remember I found it fascinating when I read about this in if it was high school and when whenever you were reading about it that salt something you have in your food every day is like it's like a metal combined with like sodium <laughs> so, yeah. but it actually of course it is very poisonous if you have too much of it salt in water is not drinkable and can just add you, you can just can just have a little of it but it's interesting salt it's very interesting I think But I was going to talk about flamingos, actually. I haven't mentioned the flamingos yet. Um, because chemistry is also so interesting. But yeah. Also, in this uh, nature documentary I watched yesterday, there were a lot of footage from Laguna Colorada in the very southwestern corner of Bolivia. And Laguna Colorada means the colored lake. And it was so cool because it was completely red, this lake. You can see a lot of flamingos. They also said it was a totally poisoned, <laughs> poisoned um, um, lake. So no fishes, no life in the lake. But nevertheless, the flamingos thrived there. And um, I want to read a bit about Laguna Colorada and I also want to take a look on Google Maps. Laguna Colorada, okay, I thought it was just colored lake, but it's a red lagoon. Does color mean red? I had no idea. Colorado. Colorado Colorado Feminine singular Colorado Masculine plural Colorados Feminine plural Colorados In Brazil it means colored or red Synonym with colorido Wow, so it means red actually So the word color in English, I have to check it this too. I usually use Wiktionary. Color. From Anglo-Norman color. 
from Latin color. Yeah, Latin color. That sounds familiar. Col Colos. Up to golden Latinity. Colos from Proto Indo European. Kel. Color, shade, color, pigment, complexion, outward appearance. Okay, so it doesn't say anything about the color red here. Wow, klar, klar, maybe. The Swedish word klar, that means clear, uh, or bright, or yeah, mostly clear, I guess, must be from this word as well. Clear, I have to check clear as well. Clear adjective is transparent in color, as clear as crystal. Bright, not dark or obscured. Clear. Okay, I see, but where does it come from? From Middle English clair, from Anglo Norman clair, from Old French clair, from Modern French clair, Latin clarus. It's not the same as color, I guess. Something I assumed and thought it might have been, but it, it seems like it derives from two different stems or two different origins. From Indo, Proto Indo European Kel to call shout. Cognate with Latin color. To call, to shout. And uh, the Latin color was from from in the proto in the European Kel. I guess it's not like you know anything about the proto in the European language since it's a dead language. I mean it's just a constructed language in afterwards. Uh, you think it might have been something like this. So but anyway here it says Kel is to hide and conceal. Okay. Anyway. Um, Colorado. Yeah, so somehow in Brazilian, this is just how I, what I, um, assumptions I make now. In, Bra in Brazil somehow, uh, or in Portuguese, uh, I don't know. Uh, the, the word for color also could mean in the history somehow at some point. The, specifically the, the color red. Laguna Colorada is a shallow salt lake in the southwest of the Altiplano of Bolivia, within Eduardo Avaroa Antian Fauna National Reserve and close to the border with Chile. The lake consists 
contains borax islands whose white color contrasts with the reddish color of its waters, which is caused by red sediments of pigmentation of some algae. Laguna Colorada is part of the Los Lipes Ramsar wetland. It was listed at uh, Ramsar wetland of international importance in 1990. I will not read all these numbers. It's also from 2009, it also includes the surrounding high Andean Endur Heek, Hypersaline and Brackish Lakes and is associated wetlands, known as Pufetales, the Pufetales, the Pufetales, uh, known in some parts of Peru as uh, Asonales, a type of wetland found in the Andes in Peru, oh, uh, and Chile. That's interesting. This is like a geographical region that I hadn't heard about before. Here you can see a picture of this red lake surrounded by mountains. A lot of white flats like this that I guess is salt. Consist of salt. James flamingos abound in the area. It is also possible to find Andean and Chilean flamingos, but in lesser quantities. James's flamingo. So, I would like to read to you about flamingos. And I'll start with James's, James's flamingo. James's flamingo, Fuene Coparus jamesi, also known as the Puna flamingo, is a species of flamingo that populates the high altitudes of Andean plateaus of Peru, Chile, Bolivia and northwest Argentina. It is named for Harry Berkeley James, a British naturalist who studied the bird. James's flamingo is closely related to the Andean flamingo. Andean flamingo. And the two make up the genus Fuenicuparus. The Chilean flamingo, Andean flamingo, and James's flamingo are all sim sympatric, sympatric, and all live in colonies, including shared nesting areas. James's flamingo was thought to have been extinct until a remote population was discovered in 1956. Sympatry in biology. I have to shake this word. Two related species or populations are considered sympatric when they exist in the same geographical area and thus frequently encounter one another. So I guess um, for humans, the Homo sapiens and the Neanderthal or Homo neanderthalis species were sympatric back in the history. Mm. Okay, so the Chilean flamingo, Andean flamingo, and James's flamingo are all sympatric, then I see. 
what it means. And here's an illustration from 1886, I guess, of James's flamingo. drawing. Mm -hmm. James's flamingo is smaller than the Andean flamingo and is about the same size as the old world species, the lesser flamingo. A specimen of the bird was first collected by Charles Rahmer, who was on a collecting expedition sponsored by Harry Barclay James, after whom the bird was named. It typically measures about 90 to 92 centimeter long and weighs about 2 kilogram. James's flamingos have a very long neck, made up of 19 long cervical ver vertebrae, allowing for a movement and rotation of the head. Their long, thin legs, these, um, also characterize them. The knee is not visible externally, but is located at the top of the leg. joint at the middle of the leg, yeah, because I <laughs> I assumed this was the knee, but the knee is actually here somewhere, and then I have to read about this. The joint at the middle of the leg, which must assume to be the knee joint, is actually the ankle joint. Its plumage is a very pale pink. It's very pale pink. Plumage. Plumage. Uh, from feather. Okay, pluma. Plumage is a layer of feathers that covers a bird. And the pattern, color, and arrangement of those feathers. Hmm. It's very good to know. Because its plumage is very pale pink, with bright carmine streaks around the neck and on the back. When perched, a small amount of black can be seen in the wings. These are the flight feathers. Bright red skin occurs around the eyes, which are yellow in adults. The legs are brick red and the bill is bright yellow with a black tip. Bill mm. Yeah, beak. I thought that but I, I only knew the word beak for it. I didn't know if also was called bill. Peak, bill, and or rostrum is an external anatomical structure found mostly in birds. Why are there so many words for the same thing in English? I guess it's the same in every language. Anyway. It's interesting, I think, that um, this bird is pink and red, and also that it has this uh, characterized uh, beak or bill bending downwards. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read everything about this bird. A 
I'm going to read about the other species as well. The Chilean flamingo, for example. Here we have one of those. Look at it. Feathers here. And the Chilean flamingo. Phenicopteris, Phenicopteris chilensis, is a species of a large flamingo at uh, 110 to 130 centimeters, closely related to the American flamingo and greater flamingo, with which it was sometimes considered conspecific. The species is listed as near threatened by the IUCN. It breeds in South America from Ecuador and Peru to Chile and Argentina and east to Brazil. It has been introduced into the Netherlands. Like all flamingos, it lays a single chalky white egg on a mud mound. These flamingos are mainly restricted to salt lagoons and soda lakes. So here we have the salt again and the soda that we talked about earlier. But these areas are vulnerable to habitat loss and water pollution. Wow, it's so beautiful. Flock flying in Rio Grande do Sul, Brazil. The Chilean flamingo's bill is equipped with comb-like structure that enable it to filter food, mainly algae and plankton, from the water of the coastal mudflats estuaries, lagoons, and salt lakes where it lives. And uh, I think it's really interesting to read about birds, because on Wikipedia pages about birds, for example, there's often a map where it can be found and breeding areas and such things. And it's like a map for all the species. Uh, and it's fascinating. Um, I became a bit interested in birds actually when I was visiting Brazil earlier. No, it was more than one year ago now, but it was in the, um, uh, the southern hemisphere, fair, uh, southern hemisphere summer, early to 2020. And then I started to read a bit about because uh, there were so many birds I hadn't seen before and uh, but kind of reminded me of birds I had s seen in Europe before but slightly different or quite a lot different and then I started to do some Wikipedia reading and it was so interesting to see because there are many species that are like they're related uh, but they're slightly different and then Especially if you compare the Europe, uh, Euro Eurasian birds, or Europe, Asia, and African birds, and those in the Americas. So this is really interesting to see where the Chilean flamingo can be found here. Not so much in Chile, actually, more in Argentina and uh, Peru, Ecuador, Uruguay, Brazil. Bolivia. Yeah, of course, here we have this area where we started this video, Arteplano. So, I'm also interested in the American Flamingo. I want to read a bit about it. American Flamingo. 
Phoenicopterus ruber is a large species of flamingo, closely related to the greater flamingo and Chilean flamingo. It was formerly considered conspecific. Okay, I have to look up this word. Conspecific, two or more individual organisms populated or taxa. Populations or taxa are conspecific specific if they belong to the same species. Okay, so it's the same species. Um, so they were considered the same, but then for some reason they started to divide it into two different species, I guess. Um, but yeah, I'm interested in the distribution of of the flamingo species now. The American flamingo breeds in the Ga Galapagos Islands, coastal Colombia, Venezuela and nearby islands, northern Brazil, Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago, uh, along the northern coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, Cuba, Jamaica, Hispaniola, Dominican Republic and Haiti. The Bahamas, Virgin Islands, the Turks, the Caicos Islands, Cameron Parish, Louisiana, and in extreme southern Florida. The population in the Galapagos Islands differs genetically from that in the Caribbean, and the Galapagos flamingos are significantly smaller, exhibit sexual dimorphism in body shape and lay smaller eggs. They are sometimes separated as Phonicopterus rubergliforhincus. Its preferred habitats are similar to those of its relatives. Saline lagoons, that we have talked about a lot, mud flats and shallow brackish coastal or inland lakes. An example habitat is the pitonous mangroves ecoregion of the Yucatan. Because I knew there were flamingos in Florida. It's quite famous. Florida is quite famous for that. So it's this species, of course. The American. Let's take a look at the map here, see where we can find this in the Galapagos Island, Venezuela, Caribbean, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Yucatan Peninsula. And it should also be here, in, but it's not visible on this map. It's so cool that it's that they live actually in the US in in Florida, I think. Also I would like to read a bit about yeah, I want to read about all this flamingo species, actually. Um, the greater flamingo. Where can we find the greater flamingo? Oh, this is typically... When I think of a flamingo, this is kind of the picture I see in my head. This uh, expression <laughs> in the face. So. I was hoping there would be a map here where you can see the greater flamingo is the most widespread and largest species of the flamingo family. It is found in Africa, the Indian subcontinent, the Middle East, and in southern Europe. to see a map of those areas. Mm. I 
think I have seen a map of it before. Maybe if I search for old world flamingo. No, but I found the Wikipedia page for flamingo. All flamingos. Flamingos are a type of wading bird in the family. Now here we have this word again, Phoenicopteridae. I don't want to pronounce it anymore because it's so complicated. The only bird family in the in the order and there we have it again. Four flamingo species are distributed uh, throughout the Americas, including the Caribbean. And two species are native to Africa, Asia, and Europe. Okay, so here we have all the species listed. Four in the Americas and two Africa, Asia, Europe. Etymology. This is really interesting, I think. Where does the word flamingo come from? The name flamingo comes from Portuguese or Spanish flamingo. And it means flame colored. In turn, coming from Provencal flamenc, from flama, flame. And Germanic like suffix ing, with the possible influence of the Spanish ethnonym flamenco. That means uh, actually Flemish. Uh, the general Fleming or Flemish. The generic name. Hmm. I have to practice. Phenicopterus. 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 Maybe it will help if I understand what what this word come from. It's from Greek. Phoenicopteros. Phoenicopteros. Literal means blood red feathered. Okay, super interesting. Blood red feathered. Phoenicopteros. So phoenix. What's phoenix? Greek. I would guess that is uh, feathers somehow. But I have to check. Phoenix. Dictionary. Phoenix from Latin. Phoenix from ancient Greek. Phoenix. The date, the fruit and tree date. Mm -hmm. Phoenix in ancient Greek means purple or crimson. Mm -hmm. Palm tree, date, phoenix, the mythical bird derived from Egyptian mythology. Yeah. Okay, so um, it's actually purple or crimson, so it's the color. The phoenix part of the word actually describes the the color of this bird. Phoenicopterus. Phoenicopter. Copterus. Phoenicopterus. Mm -hmm. I have to check the whole name. I found 
something here. Phoenicopteros in Greek is from Phoenix. Phoenix means crimson, and uh, Pteros. P no, uh, sorry, Pteron, and Pteron means feather. Okay. I was completely wrong when I assumed that phoenix had to do with fe feathers. P pteron, it's feather. Phoenix and cop, phoenico. Phoenix, oh, pteros. Hmm. It said something about head but I can't see anything about that here so it's the color and it's the feathers let's continue it's also interesting I think that the flamen word flamenco the dance Andalusian dance or Spanish famous music style and dance is almost the same word and um, I wonder if if it's inspired by these birds because uh, in the documentary I watched yesterday uh, there was a sequence when they started to dance they have a very characteristic special dance that they do in this lake in um, Altiplano and they looked very like, um, what do you say, confident somehow, they had like straightened their neck, their head straight up and um, it reminded me somehow of flamenco dance. Mm. That is the dance inspired by the birds or are the name of the birds inspired by the dance or are there, is it a coincidence that they have the same almost the same word so I have to check flamenco as well from Spanish flamenco from Middle Dutch flaming Fleming a genre of folk music and dance native to Andalusia in Spain etymology from Spanish flamenco awesome. wasn't a lot of etymology information here here we have the Spanish etymology so it means it could mean Flemish it could also mean flamenco and colloquially it could mean insolent cheek and as a noun that was the adjective okay so but as a noun we are interested in the noun now uh, it could be the bird flamingo it could mean the music flamenco or the dance flamenco or a fleming a flemish person so i guess It's related somehow because it has to do with flame and when it's about the birds it's it's about the red color that is like a flame and in the dance I guess it's the temperament of the dance the flame so it's not really related to the bird <laughs> the dance is not really related to the bird I guess Mm -hmm. 
at red feathered has a similar etymology to the common name. Other genera include uh, Phoeniconias, which means crimson red, water nymph, and Phoenicoparus, which means crimson red bird. Global distribution of what did it say? Distribution of flamingos here. So we have uh, almost all around the coast, along the entire African coast, both to the north, to the west, and to the south and east, in the Levant and in Anatolia, Sicily, Sardinia, Côte d'Azur, France, and in uh, the Mediterranean, Spanish, and um, Portuguese coast in India, Western India, and in Southern Western Asia, and a bit here in Central Asia. And yeah, this is a salt, a, an old salt lake. I talked about this one in the Climate Zones video. Do you remember the Aral Sea? It's no longer a sea because it's completely dry, so it's a salt pan now. So I can really imagine there are flamingos there, since they love the, that kind, the type of, of uh, climate. They seem to love that. And here you can see we have also the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico and the um, Florida Peninsula, Caribbean, Northern South America, and Southern South America. Here's a nice list of the different species. Greater flamingo, lesser flamingo, Chilean flamingo, James's flamingo, Indian flamingo, American flamingo. And I think I haven't showed you lesser flamingo yet. The lesser flamingo, Finiconia. Finiconias minor is a species of flamingo occurring in sub sub Saharan Africa and northwestern India. Birds are occasionally reported from further north, but these are generally considered vagrants. Vagrants. Hmm. What's that? Vagrancy. It's a phenomenon in biology whereby individual animals appear well outside their normal range. Individual animals which exhibit vagrancy. Hmm. I'm not sure if I pronounce this wrong. Vag vagrancy are known as vagrants. The term accidental is sometimes also used. There are a number of factors which might cause an individual to become a vagrant. Generic factors and weather conditions are two, but the causes are overall poorly understood. Vagrancy can be precursor to colon colonization of individual survival. Okay. Hmm. So it's uh, species that are not in the place where you expect to see them, I guess. And here you can see where you're most likely to find the um, lesser flamingo here in the world. So it's mostly in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. Western coast, south, southern part, and here in the Rift Valley, the eastern part, and also here in India, Western India. The lesser flamingo is the smallest species of flamingo, though. Um, though it is a tall and large bird, 
by most standards. The species can weigh from 1.2 to 2.7 kilograms. The standing height is around 80 to 90 centimeters. The total length from beak to tail and wingspan are in the same range of measurements from 90 to 105 centimeters. Most of the plumage is pinkish white. The clearest difference between the species and the greater flamingo, the only other old world species of flamingo, is a much more extensive black on the bill. Size is less helpful unless the species are together. Since the sexes of each species also differ in height. The lesser flamingo may be the most numerous species of flamingo, with a population that at its peak probably numbered up to 2 million individual birds. The species feeds primarily on spirulina algae, which grow only in very alkaline lakes. Presence of flamingo groups near water bodies is an uh, indication of sodic alkaline water which is not suitable for irrigation use. Although blue-green in color, the algae contain a photosynthetic pigment, the, the photosynthetic pigments that give the bird the pink color. Their deep bill is specialized for filtering tiny food items. And uh, this is so interesting when it comes to flamingos, I, I think, because you really recognize a flamingo because the color is so specific for this bird. And it's so interesting that they get the color from what they eat. They eat the spirulina algae in these alkaline lakes. An alkaline lake is also super interesting. It's a soda lake. It could be called soda lake as well. It's a lake on the strongly alkaline side of neutrality typically with a pH value between 9 and 12. They are characterized by high concentrations of carbonate salts, typically sodium carbonate and related salt complexes, giving rise to their alkali alkalinity. In addition, many soda lakes also contain high concentrations of sodium chloride, chloride and other dissolved salts, making them saline or hypersaline lakes as well. High pH and uh, salinity often coincide because of how soda lakes develop. The resulting hypersaline and highly alkalic soda lakes are considered some of the most extreme aquatic, aquatic environments on Earth. And here we have an example, Lake Shala in the East African Rift Valley. And you could see on the map I showed before where we have, where flamingos are found, there were a lot of them in Eastern Africa, around the Rift Valley there. And uh, so... Something that is alkaline, alkali. In chemistry, now I just want to, to know a bit more about this. In chemistry, an alkali, from Arabic, alkali, ashes of the salt worth, is a basic ionic salt of an alkali metal or an alka alkaline earth metal. An alkali can also be defined as a base that dissolves in water. A solution of a soluble base has a pH greater than 7.0. The adjective alkaline is commonly and alkalescent less often used in English as a synonym for basic, especially for bases soluble in water. This broad use of the term is likely to have come come out 
because alkalis were the first bases known to obey the Arrhenius definition of a base, and they are still among the most common bases. The word alkali is derived from Arabic al-kali, meaning the kind ashes, calcination, referring to the original source of alka alkaline substances, water extract of burnt plant ashes called potash, so here we have potash again, and composed mostly of uh, potassium carbonate, was mildly basic. After heating the substance with calcium hydroxide, slaked lime, a far more strongly basic substance known as caustic potash, potassium hydroxide, was produced. Caustic potash was traditionally used in conjunctions with animal fats to produce soft soaps. One of the caustic processes that renders soaps from fats in the process in the process of sapon saponification, one known since antiquity. Wow, it's so interesting. Saponification is the process that involves the conver conversion of fat, oil or lipid into soap and alcohol by the action of heat in the presence of aqueous alkali. Soaps are salts or fatty acids, and fatty acids are monomers of lipids that have long carbon chains, sodium palmitate. Saponification reactions are generally ex exothermic and almost totally irreversible. So it has to do with soaps as well. This Bases, I guess. Bases or alkalines and salts are related somehow. So it's the base is also very interesting. It's like the the opposite of a, of an acid. So when you have an acid and a base uh, together, it's like neutralizing. The pH is neutral, become neutral. That is something that I also I remember from high school chemistry. But that was a long time ago. But one thing we haven't been looking at yet that I really want to show you. Um, here. Laguna Colorada in Bolivia. So we are now south of the Salar de Oyoni salt, salt pan that I showed you before. Here is Lake Titicaca. Here is Bolivia. And here is Argentina. Tina and Chile. But here we have Laguna Colorada, and here's where the uh, flamingos were breeding in the documentary that I watched yesterday. And take a look at this. Here it looks, it's like saffron. It's like red, but it's a bit, it's a uh, more like yellow and orange, but uh, I guess it's it's the it's because of the red the red color of this lake that it becomes a bit yellow on this um, when you look at it from above like this. But it's definitely not um, transparent water or. It's a completely red lake, it's so cool. Also in these uh, landscapes when with the volcanoes and everything, 
it's a landscape that reminds of Mars a bit, so I guess a lot of mo movies about Mars have been recorded and filmed here, around here. It's toxic water, but it has this uh, algae in it that the, that the flamingos uh, love and that they, I mean, that they eat with their uh, beak and like filter it through the beak. And it's a lot of this algae here, so that's why, why they go here every year, I guess. And it's so cool. It's this this algae that gives uh, the this lake the, its red color. It's the same um, algae that gives that give the flamingos their red color. That's why they're red. That's why they're called flamingo. does it say here? Laguna Colorada, shallow red lake with rare flamingos. So I think that's it for today. I think it's interesting when you just start somewhere. Uh, because you get an idea, you get some inspiration from watching a TV program about something, and you just follow Wikipedia links, and you can find so much interesting information, I think, and learn so much. So if we take a last look here on the Flamingo page on Wikipedia, I would like to go to, I don't remember now which page is what, maybe this one. Yeah, I think this is a good picture because I would like to draw a flamingo here before we end this video, so I place this at the side here and let's try to draw a flamingo.
soon. Stay safe.